I heard it feels so good. <laughs> well, so it's 6.30, so for the people online, I'm sorry to interrupt you, uh, for the people here, but for the people online, we probably ought to start on time because they've actually tuned in, um, and they don't have this lovely meal in front of them that many of us have here. Um, but thank you for tuning in online, and thank you for showing up. This is great. I'm really I'm excited about this whole thing and grateful for your presence as we start it. Um, let's, let's, let's pray to begin. <clears throat> Not that you, you all haven't done that because there was a whole Eucharist before this, but gracious God, I give you thanks for this day and I give you thanks for the people you've brought, the people you've gathered here tonight. I give you thanks for this chance to break open your word across these weeks um, as we begin Mark's gospel tonight, but thank you for the opportunity to go deeper in relationship with you through these these words and this experience with one another. Please bless us with your spirit to be open to what we would hear in your word through each other um, and and in our own in our own um, prayer and contemplation of of this material after after we leave here tonight. But thank you for being with us in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so Actually, tonight's sort of introductory um, version of, of Good Book Club Live is going to be a little different from all the rest of them, in a sense, in that I, I kind of think it'd be a good thing anytime we're starting a new book, to maybe to do a little overview of that book. Uh, so we won't do that each time, but that'll that'll take a little bit of time tonight. I just I think it's important anyway, and it's especially important. I think, for, for Mark, because Mark is a really, in my humble opinion, undervalued resource. Um, and uh, we can talk about that more as time goes on. But I want to I read you the first, uh, just a couple of sentences from uh, this wonderful book called Mark as Story that I don't, at least I read in seminary. I don't know if, other, if that's still happening now. But um, it, it's, so this is a, uh, it's a you know theological interpretation, of course, but it's all it's looking at Mark through um, the lens of literature. Mark as a story, a, a, a holy story, um, and how the structure of the story and the 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 care the author takes with the story is really important in how it is told, how Jesus' story is told. Anyway, I will stop talking and let the book talk for a second. When we enter the story of the Gospel of Mark, we enter a world of conflict and suspense, a world of surprising reversals and strange ironies, a world of riddles and hidden meanings, a world of subversive actions and political intrigues, and the protagonist, Jesus, is the most surprising one of all. So if that doesn't get you hooked, nothing will, I think. Um, and I th and that's true. I mean, that's not just overblown. That really is... That really is um, true about this gospel, and it's undervalued in the sense that we don't hear it as much as we hear all the others. Although it is supposed to be the gospel that we hear through year B, which we're currently in, and we do hear more of Mark this year than any other time, there are all these other, all these Sundays even within year B when other material is used instead. I guess because the lectionary editors don't like it as well, or it's, it is shorter than the others, but but there's there are things left out too, so Anyway, um, a little background. So I also like what that uh, book, Marcus Story, says about, about the author's intent with this gospel. Nothing less than to transform the reader and to be a means to help bring about the rule of God. Wow. So this isn't simply a story. It is a story. It's a beautifully told story, but it's not simply a story. It's about changing us and changing the world which is remarkable to think of that as somebody's intent in setting out to write this thing. <clears throat> now, we don't, what we don't know, well, we don't know a lot, actually. One of the things we don't know is the author's <laughs> actual name or identity. Um, it might be John Mark from the Book of Acts. Um, that's one theory, uh, the, the, that he was a companion of Peter in Rome and learned about Jesus' story from Peter and wrote this down shortly before Jesus, I mean, before Peter was uh, martyred in, in Rome in 64 or so. <clears throat> That's possible. 
That's one 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 line of, of thinking. Another is that it has its roots in um, the Holy Land, but because there's a lot that's very specific about location and language and that sort of thing about that would would root it in that place. So we really don't know. Um, one thing that I think is interesting is that this is a literary form. Uh, the, the the first the first example of this literary form we call a gospel. There weren't gospels before this. <laughs> I mean, there the 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 genre of a gospel takes pieces from other genres. You know, there's it's kind of like a biography, and it's kind of like history, and it's kind of like Greek tragedy, and it's kind of like, um, well, there are, there are elements of apocalypse in Mark's story, the, re the revealing of God's kind of end time purposes and that sort of thing. That's all in there, but there isn't an example of a gospel before this one that's like that. The word gospel, uh, which I won't pronounce correctly in Greek, euangelion, something like that, uh, the word from which evangelism, evangelist comes, euangelion, means good news. Um, and and it does predate this this genre in that when rulers would send news updates around their realm, a messenger would come and say, "We won the battle of whatever," or you know, "The gods have done this great thing," or something's happened. That was euangelion. That was good news. So that term was taken for <clears throat> for this genre, but they weren't the, the messengers weren't running around telling the story of. Jesus. I mean, that's that they just adopted the the language. Um, so, what's the story about? I mean, with, well, it's about Jesus, okay. <laughs> but I mean, it, it, more specifically than that, it might be interesting to think about it. It it does not tell the full story of Jesus. I mean, Mark doesn't know anything about Jesus's birth or ancestors or you know being a 12-year-old in the temple or any of that sort of thing. That's all from other Gospels, not Mark. Mark just starts into the action. Well, there's a little bit of prologue. We'll talk about that. But it just goes right into Jesus' work of healing and confronting the religious authorities, lots of that, um, and trying to form these boneheads called the disciples, um, who honestly, in Mark's Gospel, I think more than any other, stand for the negative example. The, the, I mean, we think of the disciples as followers of Jesus, Yahoo, yes, but they mostly get it wrong. I mean, in Mark, they mostly get it wrong. In the other ones, too, to some degree, but especially in Mark, and especially at the end, I mean, they just completely fail. They've, all, they've had three years of testing, and they completely blow it at the end. <clears throat> um, but focusing a lot, too, on Jesus's suffering and death, and and then of course the empty tomb, and we'll get to that at the end of the class because it's really interesting in Mark. The the ending is. Um, anyway, that's that. So it, there there's a lot. There are things Mark focuses on and things he doesn't. Um, who is Jesus? That's a good question to ask about any of the Gospels because they approach this differently. The the Jesus of Mark and the Jesus, for example, of John are very, very different characters. I mean, it's the same person, but the way it's represented, the, the way the story's told, and um, you know, holding up humanity versus divinity, you know, they, they tell the story really different ways. So for Mark, Jesus is very human in a, in a lot of ways, but he's also very clearly the Son of God. First sentence. I mean, Right off the bat, we're told, this is the Son of God affirmed by God's voice and by the voice of demons, actually, which we don't usually think about being an indicator of um, divinity, but it certainly is. Um, and that he, that he is Messiah, which has a specific meaning, um, the, the, the anointed king, God's anointed king. Um, so he's, he's named these things right, uh, right off the bat. And that the good news of that, this euangelion that is being promoted here, is that it is also pretty confrontational. That the evil world, the beginning of the end of this evil world has happened. Where the, the reign of God has been inaugurated. And this really difficult time, this really difficult place, this really difficult life that the 
readers, hearers are experiencing is going to come to us to an end before too long. Um, and that Jesus is inaugurating a new way of being. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty, it, it's a, it's a turn. Like the world's been going this way. It's now headed in a very, not a new direction, but a very definitive turn in God's story. Um, anyway. And, and that you, as the reader or the hearer of the story, um, you can, you can expect life to be getting better because your life is pretty bad right now. Your life is, is, is problematic. Um, that's kind of the assumption um, of, of where scholars think, how scholars think the story came to be. I mean, it's, it's written for a community that's under pressure, either being actively persecuted or anticipating persecution or having recently experienced um, the destruction of Jerusalem, which is, I mean, the, the thought is Mark was written 65 to 75 or so. Um, Nero was persecuting Christians in Rome at that time, 64. Um, the, the fall of Jerusalem, the fall of the temple was, 60, was 70, rather. Um, so this, the, the thought is all this upheaval and persecution was was going on, and if you're living in that time and you're a, a Jew, a Jewish person, or a you know newly understanding yourself as a follower of Jesus out of a Jewish tradition, your world's on fire, literally. If you're in Jerusalem, yeah, no, no. I'm sorry, I was just um, who, who do we think his audience was? Were they Romans or? Well, that's what I was saying at the beginning. We don't know. Okay. It could have been either way. And it, I mean, it could make sense either way, written for people in Rome suffering from Nero's persecutions or people in um, Galilee and Judea and all that um, experiencing the consequences of their rebellion, which was going badly and had gone badly. So it could have been either way or both, I guess. Um, the other thing that's really important, and this is not absolutely known, but probably the major thread of scholarship would say, Mark is the source document for Matthew and Luke. So if you, if you put Matthew, Mark, and Luke together in columns on a page, Matthew and Luke repeat nearly everything that's in Mark. And they add stuff. Matthew and Luke add stuff. But they start, at least it makes sense to look at it this way, they start with Mark <clears throat> as the story that they then elaborate on. Now, another theory, not as widely held, is Matthew was first, and Mark, whatever that author was, took Matthew and edited it down. But that just seems funny, because you, you cut out a lot of really good stuff. If you start with Matthew, I mean, you're going to cut out the Beatitudes? You're going to cut out the Sermon on the Mount? I mean, why? <laughs> why would you do that? But So it seems to make more sense to me that Mark was first and the others were built from it. Yeah, sorry for the folks online. Is there a, com a specific community which scholarship today generally believes Mark was writing for? Because certainly Matthew had a very particular community which it was being written for. So not as much. I mean, like I say, there's it could have so, been folks in Rome. It could have been folks right. in Palestine. We don't really know. Right. So, but people taking, under pressure, one yeah, way or the other. Right. Right. Yeah. So. Okay, so you take Matthew and throw out the stuff that is very specifically Judeo and make it for a wider Maybe. new Christian world? <clears throat> Maybe, but there's a lot of Judeo still in Mark, too. I mean, so, yeah, it could be. I mean, it's, it's, we don't know. We don't know. But they're related. How, whichever came first, they're, they're talking to each other. If you ever you know, look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, like I say, together, you see a whole lot of repetition, in, even verbatim. I mean, material just lifted from one and plopped down in the other and then added on to. So I think it would be interesting. Um, if there are, I, want, I want to see if there are things that out of, out of the last week's readings that you are just kind of wondering about that we could record um, and see if we can get those questions answered as we go. Is there, and there doesn't have to be, but just was there anything you were kind of bringing from the readings over the past seven days that you wanted to share questions? 
I've got a couple of really um, basic, basic questions. These are not theological at all. Um, they're kind of vocabulary. Um, when, um, oh shoot, where is it? Oh, when he's um, in the wilderness and the angels are waiting on him, what, did, what does waiting on him mean? Does it mean they're waiting for him or they're serving him? Great question. We will get to that. Oh, okay. <clears throat> that one I know we'll get to. Because uh, uh, it has a connection to something else in tonight's material, too. But that's, that's, a, that's a great question. Anything else anybody has just off the top of your head? Yeah, Karen. So we're not going to, that's, that's not in the first chapter, so I'm not going to get, I don't think, I don't think it's in the first, is, it, is that in the first chapter? It was it, well, okay, so today, sorry, now this is hair splitting, but today's material will be the next class, um, at least that's what I had prepared, but, well, yeah, but, I mean, the short version is, the, the a theology of the time would have been, disability, illness, whatever, was caused by one's own sinfulness, one's own, one's own failures, or one's parents' failures. Yeah, because in John's Gospel, <clears throat> there's a great moment there where the disciples ask Jesus about the blind man. Is he blind because he sinned, or is he blind because his parents sinned? And Jesus goes in a whole different direction with that. that yeah, no, really, it's a, and people still ask, I mean, practically, ask that question in pastoral settings, you know, what did I do to deserve this, right? It's the same, it's the same question, I think. I so have, that's a good one. I have another one. Um, why would an evil spirit call Jesus the Holy One of God? That's a great question. We'll get there too. Yeah, that's, that, that's yes, thank you. That's good. Anything else? And if I if I fail to get there, remind me later on. Well, if you think of anything else that you want to put up on the list, say so. Um, but so next, well, let, let me give you a little <clears throat> framework for how how we're going to do the class, or at least when I'm teaching it, how I'm going to do this. Um, <clears throat> I think it's interesting to look at the text kind of three different ways. So there's the world of the text, there's the world behind the text, and the world in front of the text. What does that mean? Okay, so the world of the text is what it sounds like. It's the story that's being told. What does the story say? All right, so we'll look at that. And in just a minute, I'm going to read this first chapter of Mark, because that was how it was intended to be offered in the first place. Not in little snippets that we hear on a Sunday, or little snippets that we read on <clears throat> in each morning's email, but as a narrative that just flows. So I'm going to, that'll that's how we'll do the world of the text, at least tonight. Then, then there's the world behind the text. What does that mean? That just means <clears throat> background that's going to help us understand what what this came from, uh, the social con social context it came from, historical context it came from, religious context it came from. What's the what's the stuff in the background that helps us understand, helps us make sense of what the author's trying to say, right? So it's kind of looking back from the text, the world behind the text. Then there's the world in front of the text. That's us. That's looking at scripture as God's living word, which it is. So what is it doing with us and for us in our context? For ourselves, for our community, for the world, you know, whatever. <clears throat> how, is, how is the story living and active for us? What's the Holy Spirit doing with it? So that'll be the last piece. So the, the world of the text, this will only take like five minutes. But I, but I think it's worthwhile 
excuse me, to read this out loud, um, partly because, you know, maybe not everybody actually had the chance to read all of it, and so that way we're all kind of on the same page, literally. But also, like I say, it's intended to be spoken. It's intended to be orally performed, even. You could think of it that way. If you were taking this document to, you know, in an evangelistic outreach from Jerusalem to someplace else, you know, you weren't taking copies of the Bible, right? <laughs> I mean, there weren't copies of the Bible, right? So somebody went out and performed it, or spoke it, or offered it, or whatever. And and I I just think it's, as you listen to this, um, be, be aware not just of what the story is, but how the story is being told, okay? How's the story being told? The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed in camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he, <clears throat> and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, <clears throat> he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, <clears throat> and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, <clears throat> Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And he went a little farther and saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in the boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. <clears throat> they went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told her about and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons. The whole city was gathered around the door, and he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak, because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place. And there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, 
everyone is searching for you. He answered, let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. A leper came to him, begging him and kneeling. He said to him, if you choose, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I do choose, be made clean. Immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. After sternly warning him, he sent him away at once, saying to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded, as a testimony to them. But he went out and began to proclaim it freely, and to spread the word, so that Jesus could no longer go into a town openly, but stayed out in the country, and people came to him from every quarter. So there's five minutes of Mark. What, what do you hear in that? Or how do you hear that? I did like hearing it yeah. rather than reading it. What it, was the difference? It, it was different. I could just kind of picture it more in my mind somehow. There you go. And uh, it, it seemed very... It seemed very real, not just out of the book. Yeah, okay. What, anything particularly um, caused that? There doesn't have to be an answer. I'm just, is there anything that especially evokes that for you? <clears throat> that's okay. No, that's okay. For Deb, <coughs> sorry. For me, oh. It, it made you want to just like, okay. Ooh. Ooh. Nicely done to anticipate the ending of the book. Good job. Because, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's something I think we'll see over and over. And, and certainly, at least one argument would be at, at, in the ending that what this is written for is to get us going to get you going, to get me going, to have us be the disciple community, right? That's nice. Good job. That's great. Hmm? <laughs> no, no, it's just, <clears throat> that's, that's, no, not at all surprised. Just, that's brilliant. That's great. There's also the language, right? Um, I think, I think it is something like 40 some odd times in Mark's gospel, the word immediately comes up and and the sentence structure or the I mean it's written very um, casually I mean the Greek is very casual and kind of rough actually it's sort of country Greek I mean the the sentences often begin with conjunctions like and then this and this and this and this and immediately and they ran and they did this and and it just runs the story just runs and I think it's supposed to. And you get that a, a better sense of that if you hear it, you know, with some some of the length to it, rather than, okay, here's eight verses for this morning, and then you stop. <laughs> also, um, I've heard that about Mark, you know, the immediate. And, yeah. But he gives us so much information. Yes. It's so short. Of, of, <laughs> of, I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. You just don't get that it's as much in the other gospel, or any, or actually in any of the books. No, that's exactly right. It's incredibly economical. Yeah. The language is that's incredibly economical. economical. Yeah. yeah, that is exactly right. So from online, uh, Rosina says that she hears it as a series of pictures. A series of pictures. That's fabulous. Like a movie, right? I mean, it's seen and seen and seen and seen. Yeah, I like that. Very cool. Okay, that's fun. Okay, so... Um, where are we? So that's the world of the text. Um, we, we know, we know what's happened now. <laughs> we've heard, we've heard the story. We know the elements of, of the action. Let's, let's look at the world behind the text a little bit. Um, and I forgot to pull this up. Hang on just a minute. Let me, uh, let me get the text itself up here. So, there we go. 
Um, we'll st we'll start with the prologue. The the first thirteen verses. Here, oh, let me change this so we can see verse numbers. Just a minute. The first thirteen verses are referred to as the prologue. So that's down as far as the temptation of Jesus. So all all of that is kind of setting the stage. Not kind of. It is setting the stage for the action that's going to come. Um, so we have first. The beginning, the title, the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Like I said, saying very clearly right up front who this person is. Um, Christ, you'd know this probably, is the Greek word for the Hebrew word Messiah. So Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the anointed king. So Jesus, anointed king, son of God. Oh, wow. Okay. So now we know what we're dealing with. And then we get a little backstory. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, see, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you. So with that quote from Old Testament material, Isaiah and some other stuff sort of cobbled on, um, Mark, Mark is saying, this isn't, this isn't brand new stuff. This, this is a story that's been going on a long time. And, and in our tradition, if it's a Jewish audience, you know, in our tradition, um, we've been expecting this. That this has been our hope. I'm sending my messenger ahead to prepare your way, your way being the Messiah's way. So, so Mark sort of sets the stage for John, and then John comes on and sets the stage for Jesus. Um, John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So getting the people ready for the Messiah to be there, right? Um, Now, this, John was not the, the first or only person to call people to repentance or to use ritual washing as a way to symbolize that. That happened not all the time, but I mean, it, it wasn't unknown. Um, but he certainly attracted attention. Um, and we'll see that later. You know, all, all the people coming out. Uh, oh, no, there it is. And the people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem. Well, not you know, literally, but I mean, making the point, a lot of people were going, going out to him, being baptized and confessing their sins. They're, the world is waiting, right? Paul would say later, waiting with eager longing, you know. The, 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 this thing is starting, and they can feel it. Now, John was clothed with camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. Anybody know what that's pointing to? Other than John's a crazy guy in the wilderness? I mean, almost. Yes, it's Elijah. Yeah, it's Elijah. So Elijah, um, a, a much earlier challenger of royal authority and proclaimer of God's word and healer and miracle worker, actually, kind of the f a, a character setting the stage for Jesus in his own way, actually, um, but yeah, he that uh, Elijah's described that way, wearing camel's hair, eating eating locusts and wild honey, and so it's like, oh, that's who we're being reminded of. The, the hearers are thinking, okay, this isn't just a guy; this is Elijah, and that matters because the prophetic expectation was Elijah will come back to usher in the coming of the Messiah's reign. We're waiting for Elijah's return because Elijah's return signals the coming of the Messiah. So they're painting the picture of, oh, it's Elijah. That's what's coming. And then in, in Revelation, don't peop, a lot of people believe that it's, that it's John the Baptist and Elijah that come back? I mean, Moses and, and, no, yeah, and Elijah that come back, the two witnesses? Yeah, yeah, in the Transfiguration, you mean? No, and um, at, well, the, at, the, two, at the end in Revelation. Oh, okay, okay. When the two come, you know, and appear, and then they die, and then they oh, yeah, raised yeah. to life again. Some people say that it's Elijah. Yes, and right. Moses that and that harkens back, actually, to the Transfiguration, which will come later in this story, that it is Moses and Elijah there on the mountain with Jesus. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, okay, so he's, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big deal here, John says, but I'm not. <laughs> All these people are coming out to me. This is, this is a major moment in the story, but somebody much more powerful than me is coming. So, okay, and as soon as, you know, he says that, cue the entrance of Jesus. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Now, just a moment 
diversion here. Hang on a second. This makes more sense if you see kind of where the action's happening. Um, so Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, way up there at the top, to where John was baptizing in Judea, way down here. That's kind of crazy. What? You know, I knew you were going to ask that. So is it really? 156 miles is the river? It's about 156 miles. <laughs> nice. Good job. Um, but, I mean, it's a long way. It's not like he was taking an Uber. I mean, you know, this is a, a major undertaking to go from Nazareth to where John is baptizing. And it doesn't ever say why. It doesn't ever say why he does this. The story doesn't ever say why he does this. But from a kind of literary perspective, there's some interesting um, allusions going on here, maybe. At least you could see it this way. Um, you know, in, at one, or under David and Solomon, Israel was united, a big deal. Things were great. After Solomon, the two kingdoms divided, and there was Israel and Judah, and all kinds of problems cascading down the historical stream from that. Well, maybe Jesus coming from north to south is symbolically reuniting Israel. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Maybe, uh, I mean, that's, that's good enough on its own. Um, it, it, also, it also might be, where was the other one? Hang on. Um, oh, yeah, just kind of more even obviously foreshadowing the journey that Jesus is going to take in his ministry because he goes down for the baptism and all, and then after John's arrested, he skedaddles back up north. And the story plays out <clears throat> of Jesus working out his ministry over these three years, basically coming from Galilee to Jerusalem. So this is kind of the first impression of that, maybe. Anyway, we don't know why exactly, but it's just kind of interesting to think why that would be. Um, and fulfills prophecy? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It fulfills New, New Testament prophecy of his, one, of course, is coming out of Nazareth in the first place. Right. And he's got to be, as he tells John, you know, you've got to baptize me before I can do my father's work. Yes. Before he goes 40 days and, and that kind of thing. So he's, he's fulfilling what, what Isaiah and, and, oh gosh, anyway, others, <laughs> but particularly... Isaiah talks about in what is going to happen, what uh -huh. incidents are going to happen, uh -huh. where Jesus comes from, and, and that he has to be, be um, presented to the people. Well, he has to be baptized. That is an interesting observation. Yes, and not in Mark. Well, that's right. Actually, Mark saying, never says that. Again, it's, in Matthew, it's the history background. Yeah, yeah. Matthew goes true. on about that. Right. But Mark just kind of throws it out there yeah. and yeah. leaves us to go. Mark is very bare, I Wait, think. Why? Yes, he's he is very, he is bare. very bare. Just, just a little, I mean, if you find this interesting. Yeah. Um, what does it look like where Jesus was baptized? So we don't know exactly where Jesus was baptized, but there's a good chance it might have been someplace that looks a lot like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it does. It looks like the Mississippi. I mean, it's really, it is really muddy. Yeah, and you'll see even more here. Um, th this is this is that site on the map that said, you know, Jesus might have been baptized here. Th this is where that is, um, just east of Jericho, and that's a little more up close. What it looks like, not exactly chilly and cold, not exactly deep and wide, as the song says, but. <laughs> But, but there's actually water there, which is kind of amazing given that most of the river is redirected into irrigation before it ever gets here, actually. Those pictures are from your sabbatical? Yeah, yeah. And that was a group ahead of our group who were going to kind of re re remember their baptisms, that kind of thing. Um, okay, so... So Jesus is baptized. We don't really know exactly why. Um... The uh, and and the and the voice of God comes and confirms, yes, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. 
and then the Spirit drives him into the wilderness. What? That strike anybody else as a little weird? <laughs> I mean, it's there's like not even a beat. I mean, they're just he's he's baptized. God loves him. The Spirit descends, and he's driven into the wilderness. Which, if you ever wondered what the wilderness is like. Well, he wouldn't be the first one to run away from a calling. Well, right. Yeah, that's a great... So is he is he running? Is he being driven? I mean, that's how much of it is his uh, action and how much is the spirit moving him and all that. Anyway, it's a little bit of an unforgiving landscape. Yeah. So and 40 I remember, days... <laughs> I remember um, a minister that I had in St. Petersburg talked about how there might be this glorious Sunday service, maybe some salvation, just anyway, whatever. And boy, Satan would come in on Monday and just try to, you know, yeah, you have those yes. top experiences, and then Actually, boom, you know, yeah, yeah. comes in. And, that, is, that, is, that is a thing. I would, the, the I would attest to that. <laughs> that is absolutely a thing. Um, okay, that's enough of that for now. I am going too slowly. I knew this was going to happen. Um, okay, so moving on a little more. So he's there. He's there for 40 days, and the angels waited on him. Right? Weren't you asking about that? Yeah. So the, or somebody was asking him. Yeah, Susan was asking about that. The angels waited on him. We'll, all I can say about what that means is in just a little bit, when Jesus heals people, Peter's mother-in-law, she waits on them. It's the same verb in Greek. Oh, it's a serve when you're talking yeah, but it's, a, but it's the same word. Okay. Yeah, it's translated serve later. It's waited on here, but it's... Yeah, so. Exactly. I was wondering whether it was, you know, meaning serving. I thought, no, it can't mean that because that's the word he used for... Okay. Yeah, but it's, it, it is the same. So, so in the same way that this newly, I mean, this, someone to whom new life has been brought, uh, Peter's mother-in-law, joins the ranks of the angels in the service that she's providing to God. That's pretty cool, doing the same thing. I don't know exactly what they were doing, but I mean, it was of that caliber. Uh, okay, let's see. So, we're through the prologue. <laughs> Got to go faster. Where is my cursor? Well, okay. It's on the big screen. Oh, that's it. Okay. So now the story. Now the story really begins. Um, and and this. I gotta see if I can find my cursor. Dag <laughs> I hate it when I do this. <sighs> well, anyway, verse fourteen. There, the beginning of the Galilean ministry. If you're looking for Jesus' thesis statement. You know, Jesus' mission statement, there it is. Oops, it's not, sorry. <sighs> just a minute, just a minute. I didn't want to extend. I wanted to duplicate. There we go. Okay. Um, so, what is Jesus all about? You want to boil down, you know, Jesus' message? The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Everything else in the story is going to flush that out. His teaching, his healing, his confrontation with the demonic, all of that, his death, all of that is going to point to that sentence. So it's a good one to keep in mind. Um, so he tells us, or Mark tells us, why Jesus is there. There's also this interesting, just quickly, little clause up here at the beginning. Oh, after John was arrested... What? Wait. <laughs> what? <laughs> bum bum. Well, maybe, maybe. Yeah, probably they did. But but there's also this sense of darkness that comes into the story. You know, this the time is fulfilled. Repent. You know, the kingdom of God's come near, and it's going to cost something. I mean, John's already in prison, so probably there's even more costliness on its way. One of the things that I observe even in the sort of preamble is the amount of times in the Gospels that a pattern of behavior precedes the same pattern of behavior, maybe in a verse, 
Yes. Whether it's uh, what we were talking about before, the angels waiting on Jesus and then Jesus healing the woman. Who waits on them. Yeah. John going to jail, Jesus eventually going. I mean, it just, it's, it's very, very intentional yes. patterns happening. And especially if, it, if it's an oral document. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh, I've heard that. Oh, waiting on him. Oh, waiting on him. Yeah. 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 Right. That's exactly right. Okay. So it was the first thing he does, if you're bringing in the kingdom of God, you need a team. So he goes and finds Simon and Andrew and John and James and calls them. And, you know, we've heard this a lot. You know, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And they just go, which is a f- whole sermon by itself. You know, what does that mean? And But one thing to think about, okay, this is also dark, maybe too dark. But one thing to think about, that, that sense of um, just going, you know, impetuousness. They just, they, they hear the call, they leave their dad, they go. The shadow side of that reaction is what they do at the end of the story. Everything goes south, and they go. They're not really thinking about it. They're not really forming, you know, they're not, they, by the end of the story, they're not formed in the way they would hope to be, we would hope for them to be, in what your priority is going to be. They're skedaddling at the end of the story. But here, that same action is holy, <laughs> right? That same impetuousness is taking them to follow Jesus, at least in this part of the narrative. Except I kept feeling for Zebedee. Yeah. No kidding, right? Yes, yeah. That's for me. Yeah. So here's that would be a they fun sermon him. to preach, actually, sometimes to write this story from Zebedee's perspective. Yeah. One day, this crazy guy <laughs> came by the boat. I don't know what he was talking about, but my sons left and yeah. And left the guy holding the bag or holding the net with his hired men, which is also kind of interesting. We think of the, the fishermen as nobodies. Ah, they're just fishermen. Actually, these were like small business guys. They, they had a company. I mean, they had Zebedee and Sons, and they had guys who worked for them. And no, really, I mean, so, I mean, it's they're not just scraping by. I mean, these are, these are people who have a living. Yeah, well, he wasn't totally alone, but his retirement plan walked off. <laughs> really? I mean, Zebedee's like, hey, I'm turning this over to the boys. They're going to take care of me. Yes, yes, the impetuous youth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. New life, we're going after it, you know. Or later we're running away. Um, okay, so the five of them go off to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. Um, just another little bit of visual. No, not that. Go to the next one. There we go. That's what the synagogue at Capernaum looks like now. Um, it's really lovely. I mean, just you can imagine it must have been fabulous when the roof was there and all the columns were up and all that. It's it's very, and Capernaum's not a, it was a major town then, um, but not like Jerusalem or something. But but even so, you know, the it's, it's pretty grand, really. Um, lovely stonework and columns and, and a cat. But that's, I, in addition to the cat being cute, the cat is sitting there where the worshipers would have been. I mean, that's, that's, those are the pews around the synagogue, those benches. So you could imagine Jesus and the guys sitting there with the cat and, you know, interpreting scripture. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, no, that's, yes, <laughs> that's right. Uh, okay, let me, well, wait a minute. Where am I? Go back. Come back. There we are. So they're there in the synagogue. Jesus is teaching. Okay. But we're not actually told what he teaches. I think this is interesting. The content of his teaching, Mark doesn't go on, you know, Jesus explained that, 
Matthew would do that, <laughs> but Mark doesn't do that. Mark says, okay, yes, he's teaching, but how he's really teaching is by acting. Because the first thing he does is there's a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit. And this is this is important, goes back to something you were asking. Why 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 would they identify why would the unclean spirit say you're the holy one of God, right? <clears throat> so there's this guy with the unclean spirit, and he cries out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? And the answer is yes. I know who you are, the Holy One of God, the only ones who can see Jesus' identity at this point. We can, the reader can, because we were told in the first verse, but everybody else, the only ones who know, are the ones who are representing the competing domain. Well, the ones who have him on their hit list, too. Yeah. So in that cosmology, you know, you've got the power of good and evil in the cosmic sphere, battling it out, and that's enacted in the world in front of us. So Jesus and the demons are portraying this cosmic battle there in the, in the synagogue. So there's no accident and no surprise that the first person, the first ill that Jesus goes after is evil itself. Man, yeah. And, and, and so he drives them out, rebukes them, and says... Be silent, come out of them, um, which also sets up a, a theme that's going to go on through the whole story about Jesus trying to keep all this quiet, which seems totally not intuitive to us. We're supposed to be proclaiming the good news, right? The whole gospel is about proclaiming the good news, except not, not yet, <laughs> because there's cost, there's risk. Every time somebody flaps their lips about how Jesus is changing the world and taking on the powers and dominions, that's hastening the day the powers and dominions are going to come get him. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Here's the kingdom. <laughs> let's, let's go take it to the next place. Because if I stay here too long, they're going to kill me. I mean, he's taking on, the other thing implicit in this is he's taking on the religious authorities by coming to their home. He's in their court, you know, he's in the synagogue, and he's taking on evil that they can't take on, on their home court. The, you know, the scribes and the Pharisees are not going to be appreciative of that. And, and the people see it. They're all amazed and keep on asking one another, what is this? A new teaching with authority as opposed to these other dolts we usually hear from. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Well, it was, it was a, every community had a synagogue. Not all of them as big and pretty as that. Um, it, it was a, a major place, yeah. Not Jerusalem, but a, a pretty major place. Anyway, his fame begins to spread. Um, okay. More healing. And we talked about this a minute ago. Simon's mother-in-law has the fever. She gets up and begins to serve them as an angel, um, like, like the angels in the wilderness. But he's not content with doing this at a micro level, right? Or the people aren't content with him doing this at a micro level. Because that evening at sunset, they brought to him everybody who was sick or possessed by demons. And the whole city gathered around, and he cured them and cast out the demons, and would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. The, 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 who could have gotten him in trouble first and worst? The demons. <laughs> they knew exactly who he was. Okay, so that morning, so all this is happening. He's, you know, healing all these people, all this action, and all of a sudden, boop, it stops because he's going to pray. I think that's fabulous. Not that I do it very well, but I think it's fabulous that that's the model. Go and go and bring in the kingdom. Do the work and stop and pray. And it's interesting, too, where he goes. While it's still dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place. If you look at the Greek, it's the same word as the wilderness, where he confronted Satan. 
He goes to the same, the word is the same, not the same location necessarily, but the word is the same about where he's going to take on the powers opposing him and to be restored in his relationship with God. So the 40 days in the wilderness, was it all hardship or was it restorative as well? To what you were saying about, you know, Sunday, Sunday is great and Monday everything goes down the tubes. That, that balance of exaltation and deep testing goes hand in hand, right? Even in the same location or the same word. Um, okay, so everybody wants him to stay. <laughs> he says, well, no, let's go on to the neighboring towns. Um, that's what I was sent to do. So he went on throughout Galilee, throughout that whole region we looked at earlier, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out the demons. So he's taken on the authorities on both scales, earthly and cosmic, everywhere he goes. And then comes, I love this. It's so Markan, so Markish. This last piece we're going to look at tonight about Jesus cleansing the leper. Okay, so what's leprosy? Do we know what leprosy is? Skin, yeah, actually a collection of skin diseases. Yeah, a, a bunch of different skin diseases that were awful. I mean, terrible. Um, very contagious, very disfiguring, um, just nasty, nasty stuff. That's all true, but n maybe not even the point. Because the other thing about leprosy is, <clears throat> and, and the, the hearers would know this, the readers would know this, if you have leprosy, you are out of the game. You are out of the community. Not just because you're contagious, I mean, that's part of it, maybe where it came from, probably, but ritually, you are unclean. And because you're, you can't do anything to get rid of your leprosy, you know, ritual uncleanliness, um, you, you do something to, to make it go away, you know. Um, there are all kinds of examples in Leviticus, and, you know. This happens to you, you go spend three days in the tent and whatever, and you know, you, you, you get past your ritual uncleanliness. With leprosy, you never got past your ritual uncleanliness. You were just unclean. You were just not welcome. <laughs> you were just not part of the community. So you think about stories of leper colonies and stuff like that, that's... That, that's who they had, was just one another. So the leper comes to him and begs him and kneels before him and says, if you choose, you can make me clean, which is about healing him physically, but maybe even more, it's about restoring him into relationship with his society. If you choose, you can bring me back. You know, I, you can make me whole and all of us whole. The reign and rule of God. There you have it, in microcosm. And, and in this person who is, you know, having an awful life because he's cast to the side. I'm hoping that's a dog. Um, oh, somebody, somebody's out there. That's okay. So then the next verse, the, this, this is where Mark, it, it's so Mark. Moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. That that word that translated here as pity could also be anger. It works just the same in Greek. It could either be pity or it could be anger. Moved with anger. Hear it that way just for a minute. I mean, the pity thing you get, right? Jesus is like, oh my God, it's so terrible. I'm so sorry. Yeah, let's heal you. Or moved with anger. How dare they keep you out? How dare the community exile you, a child of God? I don't care what your skin looks like. You know, that's really powerful. I think that kind of that kind of anger. It's really cool. I do choose be made clean. Yeah, because there's passion in there, right? I choose this. It's not like, well, yeah, I'm supposed to, <laughs> or sure. Or it's all in a day's work. It's I choose for you to be made whole. Even the leper. Okay, that's...
probably enough because we uh, it's 730. Let's do just a little bit at least of the world in front of the text. And if somebody needs to go, go ahead and go. <clears throat> but I don't want this just to be intellectual or abstract or whatever. How does, you know, what we've read and what we've heard, what do you, what do you connect with? What, what speaks to you in the story as we've heard it so far? What speaks to your life or our world's life? The caring for humanity that he has. The caring for the, humanity, And then yeah. the action of carrying it out, too. It's not just, oh, look at those poor people. But then the yeah. moving and the healing and the just, yeah. Just yeah. 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 Just yeah. That's great. I think trusting Jesus for healing. and There you go. There's so much need for that. And when you say... There is yes, there is so much need for that, and you started with trusting Jesus. Yes. So, like, you can bank on that. Is that kind of what? Yes, I yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But okay, say more about that, because the next question, and we can do this now too, is what? Where do you push back on on what you've heard in this, or what what doesn't? What doesn't ring true, or what, what's a stumbling block, that kind of thing. So, what do you, what are you thinking? Well, I want it to happen right now. Ah. <laughs> yeah, that, that doesn't always happen. Yeah. So then I. No, wonder, that, say, what, what what Susan said was it does in Mark. That's that's actually really important. Because the people hearing this, you know, are forty years past the event. They're waiting for Jesus to come back, like tomorrow. Yeah, he is really late. Well, now he's really, really late. But I mean, it was the imminence of the coming of the reign and rule of God. You, I mean, it was expected right then, right? And here we are 2,000 years after the fact going, okay, so this has been inaugurated. Yeah, when does it come to the fullness of its fullness? Yeah, any day, Lord. I think that's very reasonable as a kind of, Stumbling block in in us taking this story and figuring what do we do with it, right? Because there's a lot, a lot. There's a lot in the world. There's a lot in our lives that isn't fully healed and fully made whole, right? Will you use the mic? I'm sorry. I, for me, it's the the whole thing. The whole story is so crazy. <laughs> And unbelievable. And you're like, I, I, I can't make it. I, I can't make anything of it because I'm just like, what a strange story. Hmm. This man who walks in the footsteps of the person that eats bugs and honey, and then and then and then heals people and touches people no one will touch, and then goes to the temple and and, and, and teaches and Takes drives on out the authorities. Teams. And, the yeah. whole thing is just totally weird and unbelievable. Like. I feel like we forget that. Like it's yeah. really easy cuz no, we've heard great. this our whole lives. But it's a really weird and unbelievable story. Oh, no, that's beautiful. After 2000 years it's tame. Yeah. Right. It's passé. Cuz like, you know, he, he does that. Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> no, that's beautiful. That yes, absolutely that is something to stumble on. And, and even like the pace of the story and the reading it out loud and the seeing it in scenes and all evokes that, maybe. But even with that, you still don't get the sense of how crazy radical this is. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. But anything, anything else you, either really resonates with you or is a stumbling block for you out of this? One of my favorite things through all the Gospels is is the regularity with which Jesus has to get away from the people yeah. and and reconnect with God. Yeah, I just you know, that's love that. Yes, yes, as an aspirational goal, right? Listen. Yeah, no kidding. Well, for most of us, there are those of us, not including me, for whom that comes pretty easily and naturally, and you know meditation and contemplation and 
I love those people. I wish I were one of them because <laughs> it just isn't my gig, I'm afraid. But no, you're right. That's 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 something I'd want something I want to connect with. Even in the pace of the story, there he is out there. Yeah. 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 Hmm. Yeah. That is not seeking. Yeah, that is not seeking. <laughs> as as we've just elected a presiding bishop for the Episcopal Church, I have to share this very quickly. My pastoral theology professor in seminary used to like to say, the way we should be picking bishops in the Episcopal Church is to get all the clergy in the room, all the priests in the room at once, and say, it's time to elect a bishop, and see who runs to the door fastest, <laughs> and capture that one. St. <laughs> Martin. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay, anything, we got to go, anything that particularly connects for you in your own life, in the life of the world, that this chapter evokes for you? With your explanations on so many things, it makes sense how from what beginning going down from Galloway, yeah. Gallo, the 150 miles, yeah. Yeah. make, you know, people. where we um, they're being their passion I just and it's, it ties to what she said earlier about the disciple community being the disciples right? I mean, us taking the show on the road. That's, yeah. Okay, so go and do likewise. Bye. That's, <laughs> that's it. I, I, I should say, we do need to go. I should say next, this is bad timing, but next Thursday is the 4th of July, so we're not going to have this. We'll, we'll, we'll skip a week and pick back up the next Thursday and do a double dose of readings. So again, we'll go kind of fast through the content um, just because there will be twice as much content to go through. But we won't have to do the overview next time. So anyway, thank you for coming. Oh, no, no, no.